thank you, Yvonne, for, um, for inviting me and uh, everyone who's worked to put this conference together. It's a real honor to, to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I think first and foremost, I want to thank uh, everyone who's here for the important work that you're doing in our world, uh, fellow uh, presenters, um, those of you who are, who are joining as participants and uh, listening. I couldn't imagine a more worthy cause than supporting the uh, human rights of children in our world. It's uh, also something that's particularly poignant for me as a, as a new parent. Um, I think Yvonne mentioned um, I, we have an 18-month-old toddler who's a joy and a light in my, in my life, in my heart, um, and also connecting me with all that's happening uh, in our world in, uh, in new and profound ways. So I want to say just briefly um, a much shorter version <laughs> of my work, uh, which sort of spans two core areas of our lives that are central to human flourishing and to transformation. And so one area is this area of meditation and more broadly speaking, contemplative practice. And this is about understanding and deepening our own humanity and developing resources to respond more effectively to the challenges that we're living through. The other area of my work is teaching people to communicate more effectively and compassionately, compassionately, which also plays a key role in our ability to work for change in the world. So some of the questions that um, I'll be exploring today, some of our other speakers will be digging into as well. Um, questions like, how do we find hope in times where there's a lot to despair about? How do we keep caring amidst so much overwhelming pain and seemingly endless crises? How do we engage with our community and with fellow humans in ways that build understanding, connection, that lead to more effective collaboration? These are the questions that I've been exploring and deeply committed to understanding uh, in my own life and my work for the last 25 years. And I want to begin by offering uh, a core concept from the Buddhist tradition to kind of frame the conversation. And this is the concept of what's known as dependent conditionality. This is consistent with our laws of physics that we understand today. It basically says that everything in the observable universe that we can experience comes into being due to certain causes and conditions. And this is as true for the physical realm. So a tree growing, uh, an earthquake happening, rain falling, as it is for the world of our hearts and minds, our relationships, and our society and civilization. Everything that exists, comes into being, does so through specific causes and conditions. So uh, rain, certain amount of moisture in the sky, the right amount of dust, conditions come together, water falls from the sky, rain is produced. If any of those conditions are not present, rain doesn't happen. So in the same way, um, Buddhist wisdom, philosophy, and practice looks at the human heart and mind and begins to understand what are the conditions and the underlying laws that govern the way our hearts and minds function. So internally, fear, hatred, despair, love, compassion, hope, all of these qualities, factors, capacities, they arise due to certain conditions and causes. When those causes change, the experience changes. Similarly, on a relational level, uh, dehumanizing one another or understanding one another through the eyes of compassion, these both arise due to certain causes and conditions. And similarly, on a collective level, war or peace, starvation or plenty, these arise due to specific constellation of causes and conditions. So the next set of questions, taking this principle as a foundation, is what are the conditions that we can actually influence that lead to the kind of relationships, the kind of society we want to build? And how do we hold or relate to the conditions that we can't influence? So I want to offer a window into what I've learned from my teachers, what I've come to understand through my own practice about these questions. First, about our own hearts and minds internally as a foundation 
for a compassionate, wise response to the urgent issues of our times. And then about our relationships and conversations as a vehicle for uh, building more effective collaboration and creating change. So internally, how do we engage our gifts and skills when we might feel tired, hopeless, overwhelmed? How do we take care of ourselves and keep our hearts strong? How do we keep from sinking in despair when there's so much pain in our lives and our world? I think there's kind of three core things that can support us to do this. The first is just recognizing that we have a heart and mind and entering into relationship with it. The second is coming to understand how our heart and mind function, learning about it just the way we would learn about a friend, getting to know it. And then third, learning how to care for it well. So I want to say a little bit more about each of these. What does it mean to recognize that we have a heart and mind and enter into relationship to it. As human beings, we're more than our physical needs, this incredible organism we've each been gifted. Right? We have this capacity for awareness, to be self-reflective. We have the capacity for emotion, to feel our own experience, to be moved by beauty, to be touched and connected to other life. We have the capacity to move beyond ourselves into other kinds of experience, some sense of transcendence, deeper connection, peace, contentment. These are the domain of the heart and the mind. So to just recognize that an essential part of what it is to be human is to be endowed with this powerful sensitivity of a heart and a mind. These two words we have in English um, in most Asian philosophy and religion are not separate. The heart and the mind, the seat of consciousness is here, the center of the chest. And we come into this world as human beings with so much goodness, so much light and purity. Anyone who's had the good fortune to spend time with an infant or a toddler witnesses this. It's one of the great blessings of being a parent that I'm getting to experience right now, that the joy, the wonder, the sheer delight at just being alive and exploring and experiencing this world, learning through play, through spontaneity, the natural inclination to, to want to give or help or participate or connect the profound sense uh, of presence and the deep need for accompaniment and empathy. So just understanding that this is, this is our nature, this is how we come into the world, recognizing that we have a heart and a mind, its beauty, and then beginning to enter into relationship with it wanting to understand it like we understand a friend, to understand what is it to be aware, sensitive, feeling, alert, to be embedded in a world that changes beyond our control, a world where there is beauty and pain, where there's uh, tremendous gifts and loss, to be curious about this experience of feeling and being sensitive As we come into relationship with our heart, we, we see that it's malleable. It's not fixed. And again, to go back to um, the experiences of early childhood, we see the learning process happening at this incredible rate. Infants and toddlers and children are taking everything in so fully. Everything is a learning interaction. There are millions of neural connections being formed each day. As we age, that the rate of that learning slows down, but the process continues. This process of being molded and shaped through experience. Modern neuroscience calls this neuroplasticity, the effect of experience to change not only the behavior, but the structure of our brain and nervous system. And <coughs> as we come into relationship with our heart and mind, 
as we observe and listen and learn through our experiences, one of the things we may begin to recognize is that we are not existing in a neutral field. We don't exist in a vacuum. Society, our family, our culture, our religion, our class, our race, our gender, all these different aspects of the world we are born into and the body we are born into begin to shape our heart and mind. The way people respond to us, the opportunities that are available or denied to us, the resources we have access to or do not have access to, all of this shapes our sense of self and our uh, emotions, our beliefs about the world. And we can start to recognize that this very beautiful, pure, sensitive, awake, learning heart and mind that we come into the world with is slowly being molded and shaped by a civilization that is so profoundly sick and out of balance. If we don't begin to take an active role in attending to this heart and mind, in caring for it and shaping it, the world will do it for us. It will feed and reinforce certain capacities and patterns and views and qualities in our own heart-mind. The forces of the global economy, the political systems, are set up to encourage a sense of individualism, separation, isolation, comparing, greed rooted in fear. These are the kinds of uh, experiences and habits and patterns and energies that will be reinforced if we don't take an active role in training and shaping our own consciousness, our own heart, our own mind. So we recognize that we have a heart and a mind. We come to understand it, its beauty, its power, its um, malleability and flexibility. We come to understand the habits, the patterns, the wounds that we have sustained and that we carry the gifts, the strengths that we have. And then the task is to begin to learn how to care well for our heart and mind. So this is where the training in contemplative practice comes in. There's a difference between contemplative practice and meditation. And I liken that difference between, uh, say, running and exercise. Not everyone likes to run, but we all need to move and exercise to be healthy. So not everyone particularly feels drawn to silent meditation or wants to. The conditions aren't always present for that in our lives. But we all need some form of self-reflection. Contemplative practice is anything that connects us with our values, with a sense of deeper awareness and self-reflection. And to live a meaningful life, to take care of our heart and mind so that we have the resources to engage with everything that's happening, we need some way of attending to this inner experience, this inner life. Just like you take care of your teeth, you brush your teeth every day, we need to take care of the heart every day. And so one of the most fundamental insights of all different forms of contemplative practice is Uh, This property of the heart I've already mentioned, that it's malleable, it's always learning something. Another way of putting this is that we're always practicing something. Every day, we are reinforcing and practicing certain habits, certain qualities, certain emotions and beliefs. So if we practice being impatient, rushed, frustrated, we get really good (laughs) at being an impatient, busy, frustrated human being. Whereas if we value and practice being patient, kind, generous, we get really good at embodying some of the best of what it is to be human, being patient, kind, generous. So learning how to care for our heart well, how do we do this? How do we start to take more of an active role in this shaping that's happening throughout our lives? If we want to make our hearts strong, resilient, open in the face of great pain, 
we need to be able to do three things. First, we need to allow our heart to close. This is counterintuitive. Everything opens and closes. The whole world cycles, day and night, the seasons, our very breath. So our heart's not any different. We feel uplifted, everything's possible, it's clear, it's open. We feel small, worried, contracted, afraid. If we want to support the capacity to be open, to be steady, we need to understand that the contraction and the closing is a natural part of the cycle. It's not something gone wrong. It's not something to banish or fix or get rid of or get away from. It's just part of the cycle. So how do we allow ourselves to, to go through this cycle and not get stuck? Not get stuck in that despair and that closed state. So I said we need to be able to do three things. So the first is to just understand this process of opening and closing, allow it to happen. But then we also, we need to feed the heart. We need to nourish it with healthy experiences, with beauty, with wonder, with devotion, with connection, with meaning, with presence, with integrity, with courage. And then from that place of nourishment, we need to attend very carefully to its wounds, to its pain, to its contraction, to those small, dark, hurt, lonely, frightened, overwhelmed places. We can't do that healing work from a place of deficit. We need to do it from a place of strength and wholeness. So this is the process of contemplative practice, training our heart and mind to lean into its goodness and its strength, really learning how to highlight that so that we have the resources to grieve, to mourn, to rage, and not let it burn us up. So I see contemplative practice as a, a kind of apothecary for, for modern times. There are all of these different medicines to heal the fragmentation in our hearts, to heal the sense of alienation and heartache that is so endemic to our world today, and to empower us to contribute our gifts. When we begin to understand how to use our attention and our time wisely through contemplative practice, every day we can grow new strengths. We can learn how to nourish our spirit. And if we begin to understand this process, everything, anything that we do becomes an opportunity to strengthen our heart, to care for our heart, to be in relationship with this amazing, precious gift we've been endowed with of human consciousness and awareness. So what does this mean? What is contemplative practice? And how do we train the heart? How do we feed it with good nourishing qualities? And how do we care for the painful, difficult ones? So as I said, contemplative practice is anything that connects us with our values, with a deeper awareness, with a sense of something larger than ourself. So this can be things that we consider uh, more traditionally as a contemplative practice like yoga or tai chi or meditation, but it could also be folding the laundry or taking a walk in the woods or doing the dishes. It's not about the activity itself, it's about the quality of presence and intention that we bring to it. Because you see, everything we do, we're strengthening certain patterns and habits and energy. So if I'm changing a diaper, something I do very frequently these days, and I'm rushing through it, trying to get the diaper done quickly so that I can get on to the next thing, or hold my son still, stop squirming, I'm feeding, I'm reinforcing that way of being. It's not about the diaper. It's about how I'm training my own consciousness to exist and live in time. Whereas if I'm awake to what's present in me, in my own heart, moment to moment, aware that there's frustration present, there's a sense of pressure or rushing, 
now I have the opportunity to actually transform those energies, those patterns, those habits, to take a breath, to look into my son's eyes, to tickle him and make him laugh, to have a moment of connection. And now all of a sudden I'm nourishing presence, empathy. As I'm changing the diaper, I'm bringing care and compassion and gentleness into the moment attending to those waves of frustration or impatience by breathing, feeling my body, and bringing forth the beautiful qualities. So this is an example of taking an ordinary daily activity and making it into a contemplative practice. When we can do this, we can develop our inner resources, we increase our capacity to serve. We become like an island of sanity in a sea of confusion and fear and pain and anger. And this whole process begins with how we pay attention. What are we paying attention to? Around us, in our world, the notifications, the, the things we see and hear, what are we paying attention to internally? In our thoughts, our feelings, our body? So I want to invite you to do a really brief experiment with me. Just for a moment, you don't have to sit in any special way. You don't even need to close your eyes. But just for a moment, see if you can place your attention in your hands and become aware of any sensations that are here in your hands right now. You might feel warm or cool, moist or dry, heavy or light. And now go ahead and shift your attention into your feet. Become aware of any sensations there in your feet. Get temperature, texture, moisture. Even if it just feels kind of numb or blank, just noticing that. Okay, done? So the skill that you just engaged of choosing consciously where to place your attention is the foundation of all contemplative practice. It's the foundation of all transformation and healing in human consciousness. It's the most ordinary mundane skill. We do it every day all the time without thinking. And most of us are completely unaware of it and totally overlook it. Every moment, if we're aware, comes with a choice. What am I paying attention to? What am I giving my precious life energy to? Where am I placing my attention? Or am I just allowing it to be taken away from me? Am I allowing the billions of dollars of research of persuasive design and technology to capture my attention and sell it? Am I allowing the decades of conditioning about how I'm not good enough or who I should be or how it's never going to work out to take over my mind and cloud my experience of the day I've been blessed with to live? One more time. Where am I putting my attention? Which thoughts am I following and feeding with my attention? Which experiences am I investing in? So as we begin to recognize that we have this capacity to choose, where am I focusing my attention? Both externally, like what am I actually doing? So, for example, I've been practicing um, doing less email, giving more devoted chunks of time to, uh, to my work, to my writing, to my teaching, to my preparation, an hour, two hours, really focusing, instead of always checking and responding to email, making that choice and seeing the difference, not only in uh, the sense of productivity, but actually in my own satisfaction in my work. So are we checking the feed? Are we uh, doing things that are not actually the priority for us in any given day? Externally, where are we putting our attention? And then internally, am I nursing that one thing that happened the other day that is bothering me, playing it over and over and over again in my mind? Am I beating myself up about something I said that happened last week? And can I become aware of that pattern and begin to make a different choice. So we become aware that we have attention, that it's being pulled in different directions, and that we can start placing it 
intentionally and consciously where we want it to be. And this is like lifting a muscle. This is like strengthening a muscle. Okay. Meditation exercises, one of the one of the first skills you develop. If you've ever done a meditation where it says, every time you notice thinking, let go and come back to your breath. This is a basic skill you're developing. Just, just choose where to put your attention and keep it there. And when it goes away, to not get so stressed out or upset about it, to just start over again. There's a kind of inner resilience there. So this skill now of choosing where to place our attention, this becomes an incredibly powerful agent for transformation because with a little bit of direction and wisdom, we can start to put our attention on things that actually feed us. Now, this is not to ignore the difficulties in our lives or the pain in our world. It is to recognize that I can't pour from an empty cup, that I'm of no service to anyone else if I'm all bent out of shape inside. That what I bring to the moment makes a difference. And if I can bring a heart and a mind that is clear, balanced, awake, loving, compassionate, there's much more that I can contribute than if I bring to the moment a heart and a mind that is confused, irritated, angry, strung out. So we can start to build inner resources by noticing and dwelling on the good that is here already. Attuning to gratitude, opening to wonder, to joy, nourishing empathy, integrity, courage. This is how we feed the heart. We start to turn towards and stay with what is nourishing in our lives as a way to create the conditions to digest and process and metabolize our pain, our helplessness, our fear. So that then we can respond from a place of clarity and love rather than fear, anger, hate, or just sink in despair. It takes practice. It's not easy. It takes patience every day. It's one of the most rewarding things we can do with our lives. I liken it to a craft, like learning an instrument. And every little bit that you learn to play is a delight. It's like, oh, listen to that chord. That's beautiful. Oh, wow, I can, I can play that rhythm now. So we're learning to play the instrument of our own heart, to discover or rediscover all of these beautiful capacities that we've been endowed with as human beings and allow them to fill us and to share them with one another. It's so hard to do that it's important not to do it alone, to have community, to do it with others, to muddle through together, to share our challenges and our confusions, to have friends along this path of exploration and learning and healing. So this is a little bit about the work I've been focusing on lately. My new book, Your Heart Was Made For This, is a, it's a roadmap to developing 26 different transformative capacities or qualities in the heart through using the skills of contemplative practice and awareness in our lives in a very practical way. This also forms the foundation for learning how to have better conversations, creating the conditions for deeper relationships. And I want to say just a few words about this. I don't have a lot of time left for this. Um, here, too, there, there's certain kind of fundamental insights or understandings that form the foundation of developing better communication skills. The first is simply the recognition that communication is a learned skill. It's not like it's something you're good at or bad at. It takes time, practice, patience to retrain ourselves to communicate more skillfully. And it's entirely possible when we attend not only to the skills that we bring to bear in the moment, but also to the conditions of the conversation, 
uh, what kind of agreements we're making, what sort of support is necessary, the timing, the place, all of these factors, we can actually transform our relationships and uh, even very deep divides in our communities and our world. There are countless examples of this throughout history, whether we're looking at uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, um, healing after genocide in places like Bosnia, Herzegovina, or Rwanda, um, more local issues in the 1980s, uh, bombings in Boston of uh, reproductive health clinics, where a, a project called the Public Conversations Project brought women together from both sides of the uh, reproductive rights issues. I'm wondering if the folks on Zoom could mute yourself. Thanks, that'd be great. Um, and the outcome of that project was not that anyone changed their views, but just through listening to one another, building relationship and coming to understand each other's humanity, uh, they made a commitment to discourage violence as a strategy. And so when folks got, got word uh, that someone else wanted to come to the community um, to incite some violence or bomb, they said, you're not welcome here. That's not how we do things in our community. We find other ways of working out our differences. So how do we create these conditions to have these kinds of conversations, even across wide gaps in view and values? So as I said, there are many conditions that go into this in terms of timing, place, support, agreements. Within ourselves, we can build our skills. And the, the training that I offer focuses on skill building in three specific areas, taking the tools of attention from contemplative practice and applying it to our conversations and relationships. So the first is training ourselves to learn how to be more present with another human being. How can we have a skillful conversation if we're not actually here? So I teach people to lead with presence, to learn how to show up and stay aware in a conversation. This is the ground for all connection and understanding, and it empowers us to make wiser choices when we're here. And there's specific tools we can use to learn how to feel our body more, to pause, to slow down, so that we can be present with one another, which is one of the greatest gifts we can offer to ourselves and another human being. Being present is the ground for all transformation, healing, innovation, and change. So can you learn how to lead with presence to just really show up before anything else? The second area of training is becoming aware of our intentions, not just running on automatic, but actually choosing conscious, clear, and helpful intentions in our conversations. One of the most powerful and transformative intentions that I encourage people to train themselves in as a default in conversations is the genuine intention to understand and hear one another. Skillful communication is not about what we say. It's not only about the words we use. It's about the quality of connection and understanding we're able to create with one another. And so we can choose a more helpful intention which shapes all of our nonverbal communication. It subtly, subtly kind of influences and directs the conversation every moment. Where are we coming from inside? And when I say intention, I don't mean the outcome or the goal of the conversation. I mean how we're behaving, how we're showing up and relating. So coming from curiosity and care, having a genuine intention to understand creates the conditions for starting to be able to hear each other, the mutual respect needed for collaboration or healing. I've had many students take my classes and report radical shifts just from practicing, listening with the intention to understand, coming from genuine curiosity in an interaction with no other training or communication skills. So this is the second area of training. Become aware of our intentions and cultivate a helpful intention like this intention to understand. The third foundation of training and skillful communication is where we get into the mechanics, and this is a training of attention. So where are we placing our attention in the conversation, in our own mind, our feelings, our perceptions? Are we clearly aware of what's happening inside ourselves? 
Can we tell the difference between what happened and what we're adding, what our reaction or interpretation is? And so I'm trained in a system of communication called nonviolent communication, which was founded by Marshall Rosenberg, which encourages us to learn how to identify specific aspects of our experience that makes it easier to hear one another and express ourselves more clearly, to identify the observations about what's happened separate from our evaluation, judgment, or interpretation, to be aware of our own feelings or someone else's feelings and emotions, again, as an aspect of our humanity, to connect those feelings with deeper needs, the fundamental longings and values that drive our actions as human beings, and then ultimately to be able to make clear requests, which are suggestions for how to move forward and work together in a conversation. So this is a kind of system of training our attention and communication that helps us hear one another and communicate more clearly. These communication skills help us translate our resources, our values into action in our lives. So I think I wanna end by trying to bring all of this together and again, come back to this question of how do we nourish our hearts in such difficult times? I think we need to remember what we know to be true most deeply. For me, that is that the future is not written. This isn't about being optimistic and it's not about being pessimistic. Neither of those can save us. The author Rebecca Solnit points out in her new book, uh, Not Too Late, that both optimism and pessimism are rooted in an unrealistic sense of predicting the future. And they both lead to a dangerous sense of complacency or inaction. Optimism says everything's going to be fine. We don't need to worry about it. Nothing I need to do. Pessimism, pessimism says the opposite. We're doomed. So it doesn't matter. So there's nothing I need to do. Whereas the reality is that the future is uncertain. It can be trending in a certain direction, but we don't know. And that it's what we say and do today that shapes the future, that creates the conditions for the future we will live into and our children and grandchildren will inherit. In terms of climate change, this decade has been called the decade of decision. What we say and do right now will determine the viability of life on the planet for generations to come. Are we all demanding cleaner air, water, food, a healthy future for our children and for all species, the end of fossil fuel and a rapid transition to clean energy, holding universal human rights, gun rights, as essential, all of the kinds of powerful change that the other speakers here in the conference have been talking about. The future is not written. We make the future by what we say and do today. This is one of the things that I know to be true that I come back to that gives me hope. Another is that there is immense goodness in this world. It's not reported on mostly, it's not in the news, but it's all around us if we know how to look for it, to remember that, to see it, to uplift it, to share it, to celebrate it, to embody it. And then to remember that we are an incredibly resilient species. Each of us has untold capacity and strength and that there are steps we can take individually and together to process the grief, the pain, the fear, the overwhelm that we are experiencing and transmute it into strength, into beauty, into power. How do, we, um, how do we deal with the challenge of struggling to let go of the past or feeling like there are things intruding on our thoughts and that we can't keep our attention with something positive or nourishing, whether it's uh, from trauma um, or anxiety or other difficult experiences? I think there's a, there's a few key things to understand here. Um, the first is that we're not trying to control our thoughts. And this is one of the most common misconceptions about meditation and contemplative practice. We are inclining in a certain direction. We have a preference, there's an intention, but that energy of control of trying to make it a certain way actually backfires. It creates more tension and stress and will, it will inadvertently feed 
the thing that you are trying to avoid or resist or heal. So there's a certain art to the practice of having a really light touch and being able to bring patience, forgiveness, a sense of spaciousness, um, a phrase you can use like all the time in the world. You know, I've got all the time in the world to just let that memory come and let it go. And, and so this is, this is the first thing, is just understanding the process a little bit more and how we are practicing is really important and not being aware of that tendency to try to control things and seeing if we can replace that with kindness, patience. Um, within that process, we start to develop the skill of taking in nourishment. And this is a skill to develop. Be all of us can suffer from the negativity bias, right? This evolutionary tendency to focus on what's not working, what's wrong, what we don't like, what's dangerous, the threat perceived or actual internally or externally. And it takes practice to contend with that and learn how to really put it down and no, no, it's okay to just allow myself to be nourished here. So if you're dealing with trauma, what you need to do is to really attend to the experience of feeling safe enough when you start. Knowing where you are, looking around, setting, setting, setting aside distractions and interruptions so that your nervous system can start to unwind it even a little bit. The next thing I, I would want to suggest here is um, using the support of another person and another nervous system. So especially if you are struggling with trauma or anxiety, doing these practices, engaging with someone else who perhaps is more regulated or grounded in the moment can be a huge support for your own nervous system to settle and to take in some of the goodness that you're trying to connect with and strengthen. And then the third thing I would say is to, is to really consider and see if you can trust inside that you're not alone. It's hard to be human for all of us. It's hard in different ways and to different degrees, but it's hard. And I believe if, if you're aware, it's even harder <laughs> because you're feeling so much more. And so rather than that being a burden, it, it can actually be a, a kind of thread that connects us to other people's hearts to recognize that yes, this challenge, this pain, this struggle I'm feeling is human. <laughs> Other people feel this in different ways too. And so then again, to try to not be alone with it, whether that's just in your own mind, sort of um, learning how to relate to it from a place of connection and compassion or through relationships with others. And whether that's, um, you know, friends, community, professionals, or reading books, watching movies, learning about other people's lives that take us outside of ourself and help us to feel a sense of support and connection with history and with others who are going through things that are difficult. So those are some of the suggestions I would offer.